The, uh, the television industry, in fact, is evolving very much uh, in that direction because games are very popular, very... Um, um, uh, very accessible and are make, there are more and more games that are making that leap but I think from what Ig said Chop Chop is the first one that actually did transfer there's also Angry Bird but I think we beat them slightly to the punch to the air um, so we develop from all sources um, and it also most of the time people just come to us with content and very very simply in the case of Chop Chop Alex and the group at Game Horizon were thinking uh, of developing a TV series. I think they went to see Astral, if I'm not mistaken, who mentioned our name and they came for a meeting with us and that's very simply how it happened. Um, it really is, I hate to say it, but it's really quite mundane usually how it happens. It's not usually this hugely exciting story. It's really kind of um, quite, like I say, quite mundane. Now, in deciding, the process of deciding what project, because we do get, uh, we probably get projects every week um, from different sources. How we decide what is um, uh, a good idea to develop is also quite simple. My theory has never changed, uh, both on the broadcasting side and on the production side. There are two questions. One, do I love the project? And two, is it financeable or viable? Can it be made? Uh, because you can have a fabulous project if you can't finance it, there's no point. And you can have a great um, deal or a, you know something that's easily financeable. If you hate the project, not a great idea either. It has to be yes to both those questions. And in the case of Chom Chop, within I think minutes, it was a, a very clear yes. The property is very, very eloquent, very compelling, and the, the possibility, what we perceived as the possibilities for the marketplace was also very obvious. So it was a, a quick yes, and we entered into co-production co agreement. Um, so yes, so that's it. Um, yes, so that... Uh, when we pitched, at that point, therefore, we have a co-production deal with uh, an agreement with Game Horizon, and we have to go pitch the broadcasters. Um, we felt so strongly about the property that we pretty much didn't develop anything. We just pitched the idea based on the exist the games. The advantage of having a game is you have multiple, um, there's a, thank you assets. There's a huge, um, um, <laughs> there's a lot of visuals. It's fully developed visually. So you can, in fact, pitch vi visually very easily. And, and like I said, we, didn't, we felt so strongly about the possibility of making the leap that we didn't even, we, we basically wrote absolutely nothing out. We just pitched the idea of taking the games as they existed and the characters and creating a concept for television. So with that, that's the, b the brief uh, um, introduction to how it at least got to the point that it was being uh, developed for television. Let me pass it off to Alex, who will talk about the genesis of Chop Chop, the brand itself. Hi. Does this work? Yeah, it works. <laughs> um, I guess ours is a bit of a Cinderella story, which uh, and a roller coaster story also. So we started here, we went there, then we went down again. We're somewhere in the middle right now, and that's very, uh, I guess, typical of uh, of the boom that the iPhone created. Um, we started, we were almost bankrupt. We had done a, a PC game, spent a million dollars on it, which uh, we all felt was a remarkable game. Nobody cared about it. Nobody wanted to. Tried. It was a very hermetic uh, intellectual game, and we thought it was like the next Tetris. So much for that. And at the time, we're in 2008, out of desperation, I guess, we figured out this, there's this thing called iPhone, looks simple. And our strength was that we had um, uh, developers who were, who were extremely skilled in developing very complex uh, PC games. So they had already won uh, Best of E3 Awards. E3 is the, uh, the industry leading... Uh, 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 event in, in, Lo in Los Angeles and um, they had won Best of E3 Award for actually fighting game, fighting mechanics and things like that and, and we looked at uh, the iPhone and said okay this looks simple enough to program and we came up with a game called Chop Chop Ninja 
because we didn't know better, we actually ended up inventing things. One of the things we invented is one finger mechanics, whereby instead of having a D-pad or a virtual D-pad, which everybody did at the time trying to emulate a console, we were moving the characters by just scrolling our finger, tapping and doing things like that. And immediately we got a lot of uh, very good press, even though we weren't selling a lot of games. Uh, and and uh, that became a, a, a media sensation pretty much overnight. Then we were lucky enough to meet a strange character uh, uh, who, uh, who was an ex-track star uh, from Cameroon. He was studying at the uh, University of Florida. He was like really a top uh, 100 meter runner. And he told us, look, I've, I, you know, I'm studying business and uh, I've got a really good following and I have an idea. Your games are, right now you charge for them $2, $3, $4, because at the time on the, on the uh, App Store, games were not free, games were paid, good old times. We were making money then. And, um, and uh, he told us, I've got a great idea. Why don't you put your game for free for a few hours? I'll promote the heck out of it. Your downloads will go up the roof, and, uh, and then you'll put it back to paid. So you'll go from this level to this level of downloads. When you put it back to paid, it'll go down, but it'll go down higher than it was before just because of word of mouth. He had gone to see everybody, and nobody cared about him. And they were looking at him and saying, are you insane? You want us to give the whole thing for free? No. And we looked at it and said, eh, why not? It, make, it seems to make sense. And my background was marketing, so it, there's, there was there's some merit to that. And we did that, and uh, overnight uh, we were more or less selling 500 to 1,000 games a day. First time we put it for free. First day, 250,000 downloads. Wow, okay. What is 250,000 downloads in 2008? That's number one in every country in the world. So we were all of a sudden the top app everywhere. I said, let's continue. He said, no, 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 stop, bring it back. No, 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 let's continue. So we do it another day, 300,000 downloads. The fourth day, it goes down a bit, 250, the third day, and the fourth day, something like that. All in all, in a weekend, we ended up making one million downloads, and we're on the map. And then we said, okay, what do we do now? And we realized that at that point, the, uh, the, uh, this business of games on mobile uh, was, there were some, some very parallels between television and cinema and console games and mobile games. It's like cinema, big blockbuster, things like that, television series, smaller budgets, uh, much less revenues, and you need things like this. And mobile game was the same thing. We, uh, compared to a Call of Duty, there's no way anybody could make that kind of money, but we could get by by doing more games. So we ended, we ended up on a, on, a, on a developing spree and developed in literally a year 10 different games but keeping the same branding. So we had the first one, Chop Chop Ninja, Chop Chop Runner, Chop Chop Tennis, Chop Chop Hockey, Chop Chop Soccer, Chop Chop Caveman, uh, I forget the other names, Chop Chop, Chop Tennis, uh, and uh, all of them, we were playing the same game. Every weekend, one of them is for free, downloads go up the roof, uh, up there. Uh, while the, the, the game is downloaded for free, we promote the other games which are paid, and play that ping pong game, left, right, and center. And we ended up being, uh, in 2009, because our games catered to kids, uh, the study had shown that we were in the back pocket of about 30% of the kids worldwide who had an Apple device. So one out of three kids in the world had one of our games. And uh, that's when we realized that maybe it makes sense at this stage to, to see if we can do um, an animation, an animated series uh, with this, and that's how uh, that's how we met Sardine, and uh, that's where we are right now, I guess. Uh, so that's kind of a little story. The problem we had was that the model, the business model of the, uh, the app store changed from a paid model to a freemium model now, and uh, whereas it was possible for us to make good money back then by parents paying for the games for kids, nowadays, you have, it's much more convoluted because the games or the, the apps are, 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 are downloaded for free, and you're supposed to have enough uh, stickiness so that somebody ends up paying money, paying, pay, buying something within the game context, and that's not very applicable to kids. It's much more so for teenagers and young adults, but that's another story. So that's, uh, that's how we started. Yep. Um, if you have any questions, by the way, at any time, please just interject. And, uh, and en français ou en anglais. En français ou en anglais, il n'y a pas de problème. Um, okay, so I was, um, I wanted to cover a bit the, the, the development process um, that, we, that we went through with Teletoon um, 
and, and Game Horizon. So we got a development deal, uh, and what we had proposed um, initially was to develop multi-formats, which was something that we hadn't done um, in the past, that we thought was a great idea, that suited uh, the game property. Um, specifically, it meant uh, developing a short format, developing a long format, 11 minutes, which is a long format in TV, and um, web uh, or digital media material for the Teletoon website. In practical terms, it ended up being Chop Chop Ninja Challenge, 40 times one and a half minute shorts, Chop Chop Ninja, 52 times 11 minutes, and two uh, games that uh, were produced and are currently on the, Teletoon, the Teletoon website that are doing very well, we hear. <laughs> yes. So in order to develop, like I said, originally we had fabulous designs, really, really very graphic, very modern, very friendly designs, but absolutely no concept. Sometimes, and in, 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 in actual fact, a lot of times it's totally the opposite. You get a concept, but there are no designs, or the designs aren't, aren't fully developed yet. In this case, it's reversed. So you, although you have a brand that people, that the marketplace has a relationship with, you don't really have characters. You have an image of literally a very flat character and a very flat world. No depth, no personality, no, uh, no challenges, no quests, no, no great you know, plot to go with it. So that was something that had to happen from zero. In this particular case, that it can be something that literally takes years to do. In this case, we were lucky. It happened very quickly. We had an initial meeting, I remember quite clearly, with a writer, uh, the people at Game Horizon, uh, tele the Teletoon people, and us, and we, we hit on something that gave it immediately, that gave it a context, and that was turning Chop Chop Ninja into a character. Just add the word the Chop Chop Ninja in front of it and up ah, you had a character. The Chop Chop Ninja is the best ninja ever, ever was, ever will be. The Chop Chop Ninja is the la sommité in terms of ninjaing. In fact, there's like a whole theory built around the Chop Chop Ninja of the four quadrants uh, in order to become a master. And we've made all of this up, right? In, in order to become a master ninja, you must master the four quadrants of the, ma the ninja master, and those are strength and will and cunning and skill. Um, they rhyme. Um, but the, and that's, I have to give the credit to the Rob Tinkler, who was the original writer um, on the development material that came up with that, and that's stuck through the whole process. Uh, now we're kind of toying with the idea, I, Michelin doesn't even know this, of a fifth element, a hidden oh. element, yes, that would be uh, behind those four, and that's heart. Another one to learn. Yeah, heart. You know, I must have heart to be a master. I yes. Mastered the first um, form. Um, you mentioned that you know, sometimes um, you don't have the characters that you get from your hero. And I was wondering if you had experienced the same thing on some points. Um, if, you know, the two main families, for example, you've got one person that's really good at their drawing, and they often are such a good artist. Yeah, because it, 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 that does happen. I can give you many examples of shows that were developed that way from an image, from experience, though. I have to say that when that happens, usually the, the concept usually lacks depth and legs in terms of the ability to be able to, to um, be expressed through multiple episodes. In terms of television, m you must develop the concept that has a lot of space in front of it. And what happens often when you're, when you're looking at an image or a character, I am thinking of one in particular, but I don't want to mention it. It was a great character and a great one-liner, but when you really got down to it, it didn't, um, it didn't have any legs because it really was like right up against the wall. It had no space in front of it. And I'm sure Ig would 
would uh, would agree with that. Um, so in this case, again, it's it's uh, we had great we had good design, but no concept. So we developed, like I said, we developed that concept from scratch. The whole so the Chop Chop Ninja is a um, um, a a mystical, mythical character um, that that um, was trained at the nin at the um, Ninja Academy, and our four main characters, Iro, Joe, Nico, and Tetsuo, um, are at the Ninja Academy, and Iro lives and breathes Chop Chop Ninja. He wants to be the next Chop Chop Ninja. That is his quest, that is his goal. Iro is the one in red. Um, and he represents Will. Each one of those four characters represents one of the quadrants. Iro is Will, Joe is um, Cunning, Nico is Skill, and Tetsuo is Strength. And all of them have heart, but they haven't discovered that yet. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a classic kind of a structure, and it works because it gives you a quest, it gives you a direction. So, and the other particularity is that in, uh, in, uh, at the Ninja Academy, the master, Inoki, believes that in order to become a ninja, you must practice being a ninja. So they actually have a job. They have to protect the city that they live in. Um, the city is, is like kind of every city, but no city. It's a walled town. Um, there's a lot of evil, of course, uh, evil characters of varying degrees, but there is one main evil character called the General who desperately wants to conquer the city because that would give him access to all of the secrets of the, of the Chop Chop Ninja, and in his mind then he could conquer the world. Muahaha, the, 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 the classic uh, evil character. Um, but this is also Teletoon, and the, uh, the, the characters are, are very round and very graphic. Uh, Teletoon is also comedy driven, so we needed to create something that would fit in that environment. So we're not in a very serious, mystical, kind of zen-like environment. There is ninja battling, there are evil characters, and they fight but it's also comedic. It's a lot based on the interplay of the four characters. Um, I believe that you, without good, oops, sorry, without good character, you don't, you'll never get good story. You can have great plot, but you'll never have good story. Um, so that was something that was very important. So at the development process, we developed th that concept, and then we needed a concept for the, the shorts. And the shorts needed to fit in with the, the long format, but not necessarily be like a short version of it or a game. Or it, it's important that you're creating something that provides an added value to what you're doing and not just copying or a, to me like just like short bits. So what was created was Chop Chop Ninja Challenge. And each short, the, the character in play has a challenge that they must um, um, complete, and they have three tries. And after three tries, th you're out. So it's one, two, three, you're out. Each try is a fail. So we're working with the kind of classic um, roadrunner. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, sorry. <coughs> the roadrunner um, trope that, that they will never succeed a challenge. Um, also because of, and this is where the practicality of production comes in, we had 40 episodes, we have four characters, we figured we would, do, originally actually, inter interestingly, originally we had, we were doing each, each challenge, each episode had all of the four characters involved. And in the writing process, we quickly realized that what happened was you had one character doing whatever and the other three kind of standing around watching. So we realized, oops, mistake, that's not gonna work. Do it each, each challenge is one character. Um, so, and then the next step was, how brilliant, we can do the same challenge four times. So you have the same, the same backgrounds, the same setup four times, but each character approaches the challenge differently because they don't think the same way. Jo is strategic, so she, if it's still the golden egg, she will try to think of strategic ways of doing it. Eero is just more like, I'm going to go get it, what's the problem? And, you know, that, so that also became, um, in my mind, a very clever way of, again, working with character and being 
um, econo economic in terms of how we were producing. We weren't, didn't have to create new assets for every episode. So it became a 10 challenges done four times each for 40 episodes. And concentrate on the animation. And concentrate on the animation. I was just about to say that the one, also the other little blip was we wanted them nonverbal. So there's no dialogue. So everything had to be, whatever they're doing, it has to be very physical because, and therefore concentrate on the action and the animation because we weren't relying on uh, dialogue. So those were the shorts and, and um, because shorts are faster to develop and, and, and faster to, to script, Teletoon actually triggered those in production. While we were still developing the long format, um, we produce the shorts and the shorts are actually currently on the air on Teletoon. And then the third um, element are the games which were also developed and produced and are currently on, on air on Teletoon but I'll leave that part of it more to Ugg. For the long format, uh, we are at the end of development, we have a full Bible, we have uh, six scripts and we're just finishing up the last of the six scripts. It is from experience, generally, when you're developing a full series, it's usually about two years, and we are pretty much at that mark right now. So soon, you know, it's time to go into production on the, <laughs> on the long format. Um, Design-wise, we did actually, although the designs were really good, we did actually make a couple of minimal changes, and I wish I had thought of bringing up a, um, an image from the original characters. The only thing that changed is that in the games, they had cowls that covered their mouths, so they liter literally didn't have a mouth. Um, in the shorts, not a problem, they don't speak, but in the long format, they will speak. We did not think it was feasible to do 11 minute uh, episodes with no dialogue, so we, gave, we took off the cowl and gave them a mouth. And in the games, they also, their eyes were ridged with red, making them look slightly angry and were extremely tired. So we <laughs> removed that. Um, now they don't have the red, eye, the, the red bordered eyes. But apart yeah, from that, really. And if I can add, just adding the mouth also gave them more expressions because we're getting a lot, a lot from it. So. Yeah. yeah. But design-wise, it was an extremely light process. We, none of the colors changed. The, pa the palette was there. Tetsuo um, got the makeover on his hat. Oh yeah, Tetsuo had horns like about three times his height, which didn't make sense. Like he would, he would completely fall over if he if he attempted to walk. But small little tweaks like that. But it's it's critical that it stays uh, true to the original uh, the original material. Otherwise, why develop based on something that's there? Um, so there we go. Uh, I guess over to Ug to talk about the development process from Teletoon's perspective. The first question was uh, why would Teletoon get on board with this? The obvious, the first obvious th answer to that was of course the game, getting into the game and using the game because it was quite popular and, 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 and using that to, uh, to get attention, to get people on. And uh, well, the other one was, as Madeline said, was to develop a longer format, the 11 more minute format, because that's that's basically my job, not doing games, but doing doing the longer shows. So it was a great challenge. It was a wonderful challenge to start off with this. Uh, it's a great game, but in terms of characters, as we said, it's, it's rather flat and, and, and trying to push that in that direction, the 11 minute, and getting those characters out on the page and making them come alive. Um, and then we're sort of working halfway there. We have the, the, the one minute and a half, and how do you make that work? And it, it was it was incredibly exciting and stimulating to to to, to work with Sardine because we had you know I think we started off this big and then as we went on we had to focus and focus and focus. Uh, if you're working in a one minute and a half format, it becomes almost more about behavior than actual characters. But it set off the the, the thinking proce process that would bring us to the 11 minute. You know, it's a, and I think we unconsciously chose sort of a sitcom division of these characters. One would be neurotic, another one would be dumb. And, and so that, you know, that helped us think about how it would work in the 11-minute uh, format, which is the ultimate goal of this thing. Um, and of course, it, through all that, was to keep the, the experience of the game, the fun of the game, the basic fun that every person has when they're playing the game, and that was the biggest thing. And that also uh, is a success, you know. But it to translate that in terms of animation, of course, is the clarity of the goal in every of these shorts, and then at that point, it's to 
pile on the slapstick and, 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 and put on the wonderful animation. And I think ultimately, um, sorry, <laughs> running out of breath here. <sighs> Uh, ultimately, that's 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 what you know. That's what you feel when you watch these little shorts. Is that fun? And uh, for me, that was the ultimate goal, and to start thinking about the the character process. So, um, yeah, I think that does it. I'm at the end of the, my page. I I, <laughs> I do. Uh, it brings up a very important point, and the the the, the multi format developing shorts, web games, and long format allowed us to what we learned through producing the shorts has served us a lot in terms of developing the 11 minutes. We've changed character descriptions. We've changed yeah. uh, the quest. We've been able to, that's actually been an incredibly helpful um, element in developing the long format and probably one that ultimately will um, um, help uh, trigger uh, or, I'm losing my words, qui éclaire, that sheds light on the, the long format because of that exercise. When you're producing a, a regular series, and I'm thinking of one that we have in production right now, there's a development process and then a production process, but there's no link between the two. And the beginning of production, there's always a good six or seven episodes of just kind of digesting, you know, chewing on the characters and figuring out how things happen. Well, that part happened during the production of the yes. shorts. Which so is unusual, because usually, yeah. as you say, everything sort of happens immediately in development, and then yeah. there are bits that you're not thinking about. Another part that I forgot to mention is that whole martial arts or Middle Eastern. I remember we were thinking about that. How do we integrate that? And how yeah. do we play the comedy? And how does that integrate in the comedy? And these are sort of things that we were confronted with in producing these shorts that we probably wouldn't have seen that much in development, because you're thinking about the character, the yeah. storyline. And as we're building these little one minute and a half, you go, oh, you know, what happens to the ninja? You know, they're not ninjas. They're not acting enough as ninjas. We're only thinking of the Roadrunner model. We're only thinking of that. And so, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was great to start thinking about that, and that actually enriches yeah, the, the, the development process. The, so development is very, um, uh, it's, an, it's an overused word, but I'll use it anyway. It's a very organic process. It never really ends. It, 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 there's a beginning, but there's really never an end. Um, and when you look at series Bibles that you develop uh, uh, whenever you're doing development, it n never, ever, ever ends up being exactly like you can have your development Bible and then you realize, oh, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. There are always elements that you think are important when you're developing, and then when you're start where you're actually producing. You realize, wow, well, well, that you know point that we thought was really important isn't. It's never used, or we've just done eight scripts and that's never appeared once in a, in a script. Therefore, it's irrelevant. It's a it's a process I find fascinating because it never stops and because no two developments are the same. Um, one of the things also is well visual development, which is very important. And when you look at the characters, if if are any of you in animation? Yeah, I'm the first one. Okay, so there are some. So. You look at the characters, well, their arms don't even kind of like, if they lifted their arms up, they wouldn't even reach above their heads. So then b it becomes even a question of how do they manipulate objects? How do they, and we think, as Jocelyn can speak to that, more developed a way for them to move that's very flippy. They, 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 they roll a <laughs> lot, which comes from their, their physicality. It comes from the way that they, they actually are. And that, that in itself is, is a, uh, super interesting as well. And it's a perfect segue to Ghislaine, who will talk about more of the, um, thank you, more of the, um, the actual production and directing of um, the shorts, which he directed. And he gets the fun part because he gets to show pictures. Yay. Yay. Hi, everyone. Uh, hmm? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I had two caps for the production. I, I'm a producer at Sardine, and I was directing this one. I was able to direct it because it's a short format, so it wasn't taking too much of my time, but a lot of my evenings and weekends, I should say. <laughs> um, overall, the, the production went really well. Uh, we actually, as a studio, work with Toon Boom for the first time, so uh, and it was a perfect format to actually use uh, use to boom train 
train uh, you know several people from the team who had not worked with the with the tool but uh, yeah in short format the fun part of it is that we're thank you okay we're not dealing with too many assets um, so we can concentrate on animation and what's a pleasure to actually spend a lot of time doing animation in a production is usually when you have a longer format there's a, it's complicated there's a lot of steps and and in this case no lip sync as well characters would not speak so we we could spend a lot of time at uh, you know really working on the, the storylines and the animation itself and making it look really good um, and the, uh, the the production was very smooth with with uh, Tilly Toon, so working with Ug, it was the first time that I was working with Ug uh, as a creative. It was smooth, really. Oh. Yeah, oh. wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he actually gave us a lot of liberty to be able to uh, you know produce what we had and vision for the series. So I I really thank him for that. Um, also, the it's not always the case at Sardine, but 100 percent of of or 98% of the work was, was done at the studio, including the animation. So for a for a director being able to just uh, you know go and talk to to the team uh, whenever needed and discuss issues and ideas and all that that that's great. It's always fun to be able to do that. Sometimes we do productions where the animation is actually done elsewhere, so it's a little bit more complicated that way. Um, and so I was able to to be very involved at every, you know, as a director, of course, but even, even more in, in every step of the, of the production. Um, so I think that the main challenge for this production, being short format, so volume was not a problem for us, um, technique was not a, a problem for us, it was mainly at the writing stage where uh, we've hired excellent and experienced writers that have been writing for years, but are, were um, mainly writing longer formats. So when you ask writers to work on much shorter format, and as Madeleine said, uh, each episode are a minute and a half, uh, each try is actually 25 seconds. So if I ask anyone in the room, can you tell me a joke? in 25 seconds, you know, and not, no, don't tell me a joke, actually you have to act mime, it act it out, you know, mime me, you cannot say a word. Uh, in 25 seconds you have to come up with a joke with, uh, you know, a beginning, uh, a middle and the end of the story, so a complete story being told in 25 seconds and it needs to be funny, then that, that's where the challenge was and was for me as a director was for the writer as well yeah i met sorry i managed the writing uh, process and i have to say now in hindsight asking a writer to write with no words is probably not a good idea <laughs> <laughs> probably not a good so idea. we hired a bunch of mimes actually <laughs> and it worked perfectly no i'm just kidding um <laughs> it could be <laughs> um where was that so, yeah, so, so what, basically what we did is we adjusted our process um, fairly quickly where we were getting scripts that were very long, very complex, you know, with the characters on the pirate boat going to the moon, coming back, having a part, that's, that was way too much. So we streamlined the process and we actually went from a, a, a script driven or script-led series to a storyboard-led series where we would get the ideas from the writers and take it from there. So I, I would, you know, basically take the script, um, just keep what was, you know, what was good for the story and everything and just brief the storyboard artists, add gags to it and, uh, and work from there. And that was much more efficient, uh, much easier to control for me. The, uh, the outcome of the of the script and the the entire chain of production. Um, Frankly, the only difficult part in the whole process was the writing. After uh, before and after was great fun, but the writing was was difficult, challenging. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and again, you know, we had a good team of animators on board, and also working with um, 
um, Patrick Cunningham, who's uh, actually working at, at Game Raise, and he's the creator of Chop Chop. And as as the creator, he had a very open, he was open-minded all all through the production with you know, uh, changing some of his characters, his babies, basically, even making modifications. Sometimes with creators, it's something difficult to do, but it was very open all through the, the production. So that was, that was actually fun. So I, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So we have, yes, we have four, uh, four episodes that we brought uh, for you. So if you would like to roll them, please. Anything to add, Jocelyn? No. It's fun to see them on a huge screen. Yeah. Um, any questions? We have, we have five minutes left. Any questions? Okay, the question was, why did we decide to create without dialogue? And now, is it difficult to create dialogue for the characters? So there's two questions. Uh, <laughs> that without dialogue for the shorts was to force the, the, the cartoony, gag-like um, um, storytelling, which we felt suited the short format. We also wanted, uh, there's the game-like feeling to it with the three tries, and that's why there's that... Uh, iconography with the, the panels and the X's, which is very game-like. That's why we chose the, yep. Also the games themselves, the origin is um, because, because it was uh, to appeal to a worldwide audience, it had to not have any words. So the, between the, the games and the shorts to make the link that was more uh, holistic to, uh, to not uh, necessarily inject dialogue at that stage. And for the 11 minutes, uh, no, it's not difficult at all to, to, give them, to give them dialogue. Actually, it's very, uh, it's not a problem. It's, it was actually more of a problem to not, um, to keep them quiet than now. It's fun to have them speak on paper anyway. <laughs> yeah. Also, you know, when you're producing a series, you want to make sure that you can set it well internationally so by removing by, by not having to have to create dubs or translations of it it helps quite a bit to be able to set it to other broadcasters so they don't have to pay for the translations so it's it's something that we're as producers we're you know making sure that we maximize that part of it and it, I think a too is uh, actually a conscious creative decision to, to sort of remain in that Buster Keaton sort of universe, which fit in with the game, as you said, but also to exploit that sort of comedy, which we don't do that often. Most of our stuff is dialogue, it's 11 minutes, so it was kind of fun to delve into the Buster Keaton kind of territory. <laughs> for, for specifically for development? Uh, in the case of, um, uh, of the short, then we had a small team. At, I think we had about eight animators, something like that, and the production took over a year, about a year, 12 months of production. We, c we could have worked with more people and tried to, you know, s uh, remove some time from that. But we, we wanted to just add, work with less people, but on a longer cycle. So, and that was also good for me since I had other tasks for in the studio. But, uh, so, um, but again, it's a, it's a much less complicated pipeline than, than a, a standard 11-minute series where you have all the, you know, the writing on. We are producing a series called Toon Mark Marky right now for Teddy Toon, which is 40 times 11 minutes. 
and uh, the writing is taking, just the writing is taking about a year, right? The cycle? Yeah. We started last year in uh, yeah. We started in the fall writing scripting and we will be, and of course that, it's um, it's uh, in courbe like that. Uh, right now we're, uh, we're coming out of the huge crunch, but we will finish only in September. Uh, the, the scripting and production takes usually about 18 months. So what we started in the fall of 2014 will be on the air in the fall of 2016. Yeah. Two years. Yes. Did you have to be sensitive at all to Japanese culture and history when you were uh, you know, creating the season, uh, or is that not really a consideration? Of course, it's a consideration to be uh, to be. <laughs> Part of me wanted to say nah, but yes, of course, it's a consideration. Um, we, it's actually important that we create a world that is fictitious. Mm. We are not in Japan. This is not, you know, uh, in any way, shape, or form an accurate depiction of Japanese culture. And I think if we do that, all of those issues kind of disappear because it's clear that we're not. We're and, not uh, and when we started off, I think we wanted more postmodern than it ended up being. Like we wanted to mix different times, different different yeah. areas, mm -hmm. but just for the basic comprehension and, and, and to get through the story, I think we had to go back a little more to that ninja concept and, and so they were more And it comes back way. also to, to the original game, being true to that original IP exactly. that, that it's ninjas, it's clearly Asian. So you're right, I'd forgotten about that, that we had considered oh, yeah. integrating more modern elements, but it, that just naturally didn't happen. Hmm. Actually, uh, I <laughs> it is working. ironically, um, China is, yeah. for the games, the biggest country on a per capita basis for us. Uh, we're over-indexed and it's the States. And the worst country is probably Japan. <laughs> Go figure. Yes. Um, this obviously was the popularity of the game that started it all off. It was a great opportunity. Now also, there, at the time, there was a theory, I don't know how still popular that is, that people who interacted with the web watched or stayed tuned into Teletoon, and so that was another great opportunity. But um, I think, yeah, I think the, the fun of the game is what drove us, in, you know, to, to, to want to develop it and, and the popularity also. So in terms of that, that's how I would answer that. Which doesn't mean that they'll only look at material based on a game. Uh, right at the beginning, I talked about different ways of, of developing. Toon Martin Marty, which we're producing now also with Teletoon, is a completely original idea. It's not based on anything, and it was created by four young, um, uh, four young Author. authors, creators, uh, that did a information um, at um, Linus and created that property there and then we ended up having that but yeah so it was a complete and it it just it fits Teletoon that's why so if it's a good fit that's some, it's something that they'll consider if it's based on something popular all the better but then there's the concept there's the artist and is talking with the people and, and their ideas is basically what gets us on board also it's like I find that's the most important part like you get lot pitched lots of great concepts which work well, but it's the exchange with the artists and the creators and the producers which would definitely convince us to hop on board or not. So as content creator, when we develop concepts internally or ideas or even when, we l when people come to Sardine and show us projects that they've developed, we always make sure that we have broadcasters in mind. Either, th you know, um, we're working with public broadcasters as well, so if it's a preschool show, then we know well what each broadcaster is broadcasting and we try to make sure that the, the IP, the property, brands well with, uh, with the broadcasters. So it feels natural when we pitch a project to, to one of the broadcasters that, oh yeah, I could see that on, you know, on, uh, on, on our slate we have. So, and, and even we push that even more and say it could fit well at that time of the day with that between that show and that show you know so we make sure that it it's well branded for 
a particular broadcaster. We, we understand where it could potentially fit. For me, the most important thing is the vision of the creator. If, they, if they're very clear and they're very passionate about, passionate about the idea and they can express it and they can communicate it and it's exciting, we all want great projects, whether you know, at all levels of, of in, really at all levels and through everybody involved in this industry wants to be involved with great projects that, that are fun and that, because it takes a long time um, and a lot of energy. So that's, that's the foundation of it. Without that, it's not fun. And some projects are, are great, but on peut pas les placer, they're, you know, they don't fit with broadcasters in, in Canada, you know, so like you said, comedy with Tele2, you know, if we go to Tele2 and then we pitch a show that is a great show, but it's all adventure and, you know, it's, it's, th then it's going to be tough. It, it, it doesn't fit with their channel, with, you know, so. Um, you have an adventure show? Yeah. Mm? Bring along, we're interested. No. <laughs> Are you? Okay. Oh, we have one already. <laughs> There. Determine that it's um, first of all, uh, hello, Mr. Potterton. Um, it's a very soft science. Um, target audiences vary from even from broadcast and even how they identify those uh, slots change from broadcaster to broadcaster and certainly from country to country. Um, so how you know here we talk about four to six, six to nine, six to twelve, eight to twelve, uh, and then teen. Like I said, it's a soft science. Then to me, there's the confusion between the target audience, which is the one that you're aiming for and you're developing for and you're writing for, and the actual audience that that show gets. So something like SpongeBob, which was developed as a preschool show, ultimately got a much broader audience. Um, that happens all the time. My theory is the more narrow the, fo the, the target, like when you're shooting for a, a target or dropping a pebble in the water, the more focused that target, the more it will, it will be able to radiate broader. Uh, what, what you don't want to do is be mushy in terms of what you, wh who you're aiming for. That, that's my theory. So something like um, uh, Chop Chop, it is a... I'd say a, 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 a micro tar target of eight. Yeah, that's about there. Yeah. Eight to ten. We usually aim for ten at uh, ten years old boys at around Teletoon, but yeah, we we went for the we also have space for the eight year old and sort of that, that yeah. space and that that filled in Saturday morning about what we'll get. I also find that in terms it's it's a shifting idea like I, I, yeah. I even with 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 kids they become more sophisticated with time so you sort of have to tune into you know what's going on what's uh, you know, and they're exposed to more and more things so it, it, it as you said it's a soft science but it's also an ad, you know you have to adapt to this increasingly sophisticated audience i find that what i'd watch when i was 10 is uh, is, is miles away from anything that 10 year olds watch today so it has to do Yes. Yeah, that's the 10 year olds, right? <laughs> a right. bit of a reverse example. Um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, we have people on the panel that must leave uh, because it's 11.08. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.